am now because some people may think that this is not real. If, the, if you could ask the audience if there's anybody here who thinks it's fake, if they'd like to come up and have, have a listen. Uh, you mean someone volunteering? I'll float it off, yeah. Well, you know all that? Hello. Welcome to my corner. Closer, 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 closer. Five. How did I get here? It all started innocently. One morning I went to see my 12-year-old daughter's school science project. I would be in for a surprise. I'm Jane. And I'm Emily. And this is our project. It's called Why, Why We Fart. Fart. Everyone farts, including the Queen. Although everybody farts, many of us are afraid to admit it and even discuss it. Gases are created by digestion and inhalation. The gases move down the intestine. When enough gas is collected, the gas pushes out the rear end, sometimes with explosive sound. <laughs> that is when a fart is created. The surprise wasn't how many farts each of us inhales, although that was something that I didn't know. A liter a, a day. Why are we afraid of farts? People began fearing farts when humans started caring more about appearance and popularity in the Middle Ages. Since farts have a strange sound, along with a bad smell, farting was sometimes associated with bad morals and poor hygiene. People are afraid of farts because they trigger instinctive disgust. People are afraid of being seen as disgusting. Another cause of farts is produced by bacteria during digestion. When partially digested carbs reach the colon... Unfortunately, I nodded off during Jane and Emily's presentation. I came to with a shock. Why we should really, really be afraid, afraid of farts. Farts could destroy our world. Seriously, cow farts are polluting our planet and that could ultimately lead to the total destruction, destruction of, of all humans. The kids had stumbled on science that says that agricultural animals have a huge effect on climate change. Along with the CO2 pouring out of our cars, factories and airplanes, animal gas is rapidly contributing to a situation that increasingly smells like oblivion. Uh, are, are we all going to die because of farts? I have never been a great fan of farts. I've always considered them gross or juvenile. <laughs> But when I realized they could spell the end of our world, I had to look deeper. And it wasn't just cow farts. It seems like we are farting up the whole world in every way possible. It's becoming a matter of life and death. If not for me, for the kids. Maybe it is finally time for us to face our own emissions. Like a lot of people, I used to think climate change was something far away into the future. But when I woke up, I realized this is the future. It's here. One day, it hit home. A sudden exceptional rise in temperature would produce dramatic flooding all around me.
People in my own neighborhood were climate change refugees. And an image of me walking through flooded suburban Montreal would land on the cover of the National Magazine for Climate Scientists. A sign of the times. This is a science fiction movie, absolutely. You, you're, a, you're part of the science fiction movie. I'm part of the science fiction movie, so I hope I'm, I'm the good guy. We're filling our atmosphere full of farts. Yes, we have stink up the whole world, but we have no means to realize it. Maybe, Dr. Yeah. Mojeev Latif is one of Europe's most prominent climate scientists. So carbon dioxide is invisible. It's a gas. Gases are invisible, OK? Uh, we can't smell it. We can't hear it. We can't taste it. And we can't touch it. Okay, no way that we realize that something incredible is happening. Uh, imagine a uh, really thick uh, fog, you know, smog. This is basically uh, how it would look like. People don't really see what they are doing. I mean, for, for carbon dioxide, uh, uh, imagine that carbon dioxide would turn the atmosphere brownish, our air brownish. I, okay, I think. Uh, uh, people would immediately uh, understand uh, that something is happening which should not happen, okay? And then they uh, would be willing uh, to, to, to cope with the problem and, and to do something about it. But this exactly is not happening. We are having no sense for what's happening, and that's the problem. How did farts become such monsters? I used to think they were just funny. The earliest known joke, dating back 2,000 years from ancient Samaria, was discovered in modern-day Iraq in the 1990s. It was, of course, a fart joke. The other day, my dog farted so loud, she thought somebody was at the door. <laughs> There's no unofficial rule of telling fart jokes or, or not telling fart jokes, but here's some things to think about. Um, fart jokes are considered low humor. What does really low humor even mean? I think it's class bound. I think that um, white collar people who are the gatekeepers of our culture don't like the idea of anything that st uh, strikes them as being kind of working class, lowbrow, simple, or I would say innocent. And then he'd just start farting really loud. <laughs> he would, and he'd hit my shoulders down and angrily say, don't laugh, don't laugh. Don't you be selfish and ruin this for me with your laughter. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's sort of like a power chord. When a musician plays a power chord, it's pretty simple, but it's raw and effective. And uh, so it's a fart joke. From the moment we are born, farts terrify and perplex us. then you are probably doing it right now, I don't know, because you're doing it with your butt. <laughs> Body, it goes without Julia Enders, gastroenterologist and science writer, is probably the closest thing to an expert on farting. Definitely have farted many times in my life, and if there is one person that tells you they haven't, I would not invest money in them because they're not being honest. I think not many people know exactly how farting works and how it takes place. And the actual just basic mechanism behind that is that there are many bacteria in our gut and they do many helpful things. Um, they nurture our gut cell walls, they try to keep everything clean, they detox some stuff, even produce vitamins, all kinds of those things. But then they also produce some gases, just like us humans do on planet Earth, we also do that. So do they, we're sort of their world. Um, so when they produce those gases, they can sum up and then um, they will have to get out somehow. Uh, and they do this uh, by going to the end of our gut, um, where there are two muscles. 
And there are some sensory cells that will analyze, oh, what's been delivered, oh, this is gas, and then they'll tell the brain, and then the brain can have like a final word on this and try to hold it back when it wouldn't really work with our surroundings at the moment. Or they can just be like, oh, all right, let it go. Early in my life, I think my relationship with farting was like most others. I would be embarrassed if it would be in big groups. Um, I would really try to hold it back then. Um, so I think I was pretty like average in that term and now I think I've become a bit more relaxed which doesn't mean I'm in favor of just farting all the time everywhere. We're not divine, we're not flawless and we produce funny sounds and we can't control them and it's all us being organic and having um, all aspects of life and I think this is sometimes not matching with our image of this perfect almost ma machine-like um, human that we try to be in, in these days. None of us really likes to think of ourselves as animals. As Julia explains, we have two assholes. As a fart travels down the intestine, it must first pass through a portal that opens unconsciously, putting pressure on the next portal. This is where things can get tough, as there is only one door that stops us from letting a fart go into the world. Even in our so-called modern era, most of us never get over our fear of farting. Hailed as a crazy man, Matthew Silver is one of the world's most famous performance artists and a true fart liberationist. What, what does that mean? What, what are you trying to say with that? It's okay, it's something that everybody does, but yet if someone were, were to fart right now, mm -hmm. we'd all look at that person like we've never done that. We've never farted. Everybody farts. Yes! All these people fart. Yes! That guy farts. Yes, this guy farts. Everybody has a butthole. And they gotta let it out. We let out air out of our butt. And butts are funny. Yes! Do you understand? <laughs> Love now! We're at a tipping point where we're ex we're accepting love more, but we still we still s suffer a little. We still deny what is real about human nature. <laughs> we're like animals, but we're not like animals too. We're divinity. Could the dramatic contradiction between our animal nature and our human pretensions explain the rise of Le Petit Man? Here was a unique performer who would be celebrated far and wide for his ability to fart at will. While in the army, Joseph Pujol discovered he had a special talent. He was able to draw air or water up his anus as easily as he could breathe. Years later, as the toast of Paris, his performances would literally knock people out. For two decades, this elegant and righteous man was a top performer in Paris, which then meant the world. 
His dignified demeanor played no small part in his success. While the artistic elite labeled his act perverse and disgusting, audiences packed Le Moulin Rouge. Front row seats were fine. His farts were odorless. For an increasingly modern but uptight Europe, Le Petit Man was the escape valve of his time. Notables often visited in disguise. They included King Leopold of Belgium, Edward, Prince of Wales, and Sigmund Freud, no stranger to the devastating power of the clenched anus. When Le Petit Man stopped performing at the beginning of World War I, the glory days of paid public farting were over. The entertainment value of farting is often denied. <laughs> okay. Oh, so I'm starting without me. <laughs> so uh, ideally, I'm sure you guys all know and everybody else at home, <laughs> you actually put it on a chair and you hope that the... The whoopee cushion is the most popular novelty toy ever invented. In my hand, I have Toronto's Greatest achievement. W would you like to try it? Uh, I do have to do it. I will... I'll, I'll do it first. Okay, so the, very easy to do. The technique is you, you put the cushion down. But many people here don't even know what this device is. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> Why is it funny? Why is it funny? <laughs> There is a sound. Yeah, the sound is funny. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give it a shot. Stop for law. What is this? Are you ashamed? Toronto, you made this. You made this, Toronto. <laughs> Excellent. Hi there, good afternoon. Hi. So, so if we were to build a plaque, where do you think it should go? I don't know, it's right there. Right there? On Betty's door. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, she lives in the wrong place. Because I worked there. there. No. I worked there. It was a rubber plaque right there. And what was the name of the... It rubber? was either Dayton or, or Jim. Now, I forget what... what I think it was Dayton. But I'm not wrong. Sit on it. And embarrass myself? Sit. What are you going to do, Mark? Your movie's starting out, too. You're a blogger. Burn in your blogger. What do you. <laughs> what do you think of this? What do you think? <laughs> did you sit on it, Don? We all did. We all did. What's it supposed to do? Uh, we'll find out. Well, it's Why? safe. It's entirely safe. I did it. <laughs> Mark did it. Betty did it. Sit down, Betty. Okay? <laughs> <Hey. laughs> <laughs> For the diehard, these were great. But nowadays, push of a button. Wow. And great range. <laughs> I mean, the younger kids love these, but when the younger kids grow up, they invest in these. So they, they move into a yeah. more sophisticated... Yeah, a little uh, bit more sophisticated form of a fart machine, which is funny with fart machine because when we get phone calls for them, you'll hear the hesitation. Um, um, do you have a, a flatulent machine? And I'll say, you mean a fart machine? Oh, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I like that one. You know short what? and sweet. He or, looks like a short and sweet no. carter, doesn't he? <laughs> They may be funny, but farts are so mortifying, they can make or break a budding romance. My husband and I have been together for 10 years. Neither one of us has ever farted in front of one another. Not so sure. <laughs> and I was doing a lot of writing, a lot of articles for other outlets and venues. And wouldn't you know, the piece that I write about farts is the one that goes the most viral of any post I've ever written. Comments on Facebook were so great that I had to copy and paste them. Nope, 
I've been married for almost 10 years and I still try to hide it. Um, and like, yeah, there, I have a hesitation. Like, I don't want to be known as the fart lady. This is disgusting. Have you no respect for anyone with about 10 question marks? Flatulence has been a serious obstacle in human relationships for a very long time. The story of Abu Hassan is an eternally popular tale from the Arabian Nights. A wealthy and powerful merchant, Abu Hassan, is devastated by the death of his beloved wife. Mm. Summoning the matchmaker, he is determined to once more find happiness. Wedding is the event of the year. No expense is spared. The new bride and her loving father sit beside Abu Hassan at the wedding podium. It happens when he proposes a toast. interested in that I ever even approached that subject. I would never even think about uh, doing that. And it was mostly because the girl never did it in front of me. I had a girlfriend that it was off limits. Like we were watching something and it came up and she was like, don't ever even think that that's acceptable in front of me. And I was like, oh, all right. And yeah, and then it, it like, it hurt. I know that it hurts. Hold them in. It hurt. <laughs> and you're like, now what do I do? <laughs> now I gotta like run out of the room. Could you tell us a little bit about this a specific incident, a turning point incident in, in your lives? It was a big moment that he remembers even more clearly than I do all these years later. We'd been close enough to be getting ready together to go out, and yet it still was not close enough for us to feel comfortable, you know, crossing the fart line. She was in the bathroom. I stepped in behind her. So now, yeah, there were mirror, there was a mirror here, and there were mirrors behind us. So you had that like kind of weird thing, and uh, and I'm looking at her as she's getting ready, and I think she bent over to get something, and uh, <laughs> just, you know. <laughs> you know, I was certainly must have been an accident, um, but I was feeling comfortable enough that I looked up at him and kind of smiled and was like wondering, where is this going to go? What are you going to think now? When she said "oops" and smiled at me, that I was like kind of <laughs> over like elated like okay that that's great yeah our eyes met that little bit a little bit of surprise and then you smiled and, and giggled and said oops and i was like that's awesome so even though i'm an open and direct person to fart in front of somebody else and especially somebody it we were close but it was still a newer relationship um so yeah i think there's always that moment of okay i don't know that i would feel like it was a deal breaker because we were closer than that but at the same time, you always kind of wonder, well, what's he going to think now? Overwhelmed by burning shame, Abu Hassan flees his home city and journeys far to the east. In this new land, this gifted merchant once again grows wealthy and powerful. But one day he tastes a fig from his former homeland. Ooh. It was time to return. Unfortunately, shame 
like a fart, lingers. When was I born, Mama? You were born the year Abu Hassan farted. <gasps> and it can be lethal. You got to find somebody you can fart in front of. That's that's the moral of this whole story. A, a perfect marriage is somebody you can advice. fart in front of. Yeah, that's all right. You could write a book on that. No, I don't want to be the fart lady. There is so much to hate about farts. They stink. And now they're everywhere. Soon, at the rate we're going, the entire atmosphere will be one big fart. But what if I'm wrong? What if farts aren't all bad after all? What if inhaling farts is actually good for you? Anywhere I go, and people blame me for the smell. In the corridor, if nothing happened, they just smell something abnormal. They said, oh, that must be come from Dr. Wong's lab. And that lab produced all those uh, fart gas and the things. I, I constantly defend myself. It's not me. Next guy, but it's not me. But useless. So the, to the point, I give up. I said, yes, we are starting fart. And you cannot live without fart. When a patient has a heart attack, can we give the patient a bag of fart? and so that the patient can, resusc can be resuscitated, right? Sounds crazy, but not that far from the truth. Welcome to the Fart Lab. Here, farts don't poison people. They don't destroy the atmosphere, nor ruin dates. Here, farts can prevent heart disease, strengthen immune systems. This is a fart remover. Fart remover. <laughs> and maybe bring grandma home from the hospital. Laurentian University's Professor Wang has garnered worldwide attention with his studies of the effects of hydrogen sulfide, which is about 1% of a human fart. But it's the part that most of us object to, the part that stinks. Here, teams of scientists pump this essential fart ingredient into the veins and brains of animals with astounding results. So he's taking uh, the aorta of a, of a mouse, yep. adding hydrogen sulfide to see if, it, uh, it, if there is a contraction or a relaxation. relaxation. Can I ask you what you're discovering? Hydrogen sulfide causes significant relaxation. So we're trying to see if the cell count is maintained when it's treated with uh, higher and higher concentrations of uh, hydrogen sulfide. This was crazy. Farts weren't just good they could save lives. The low level of hydrogen sulfur will constitute the foundation of Alzheimer or Parkinson's disease. What? Yeah. We solved hydrogen sulfide, the one form of sulfur in our body. Our body cannot function normally. And that phenomenon and that observation can extend it from hypertension to cancer to our neurodegenerative disease, even that will affect our sperm production. The way we fart is a reinforcing signal and tell us hydrogen sulfur is always with us. To understand the revolutionary aspect of Dr. Wang's research, we need to go back in time to the emergence of sulfur-based life forms. While we have evolved into oxygen-based life forms, we still rely on our sulfur metabolism. That's why exposure to trace amounts of hydrogen sulfide is healthy, says Wang. Just as hot springs have long been renowned for their life-giving properties, breathe deeply. That rotten egg smell turns out to be the fragrance of good health. And we produce sulfur, and we live on it. We eliminate sulfur production and actually the hydrogen sulfide production from the experimental mice. And those mice develop hypertension. When a patient has a heart attack, now what we are doing is we try to 
using the old trick, which is hydrogen sulfur based energy production, and give that to our patient, so that during that five or six minutes time, hydrogen sulfur can replace oxygen and save our life. Just give a small bag of fart gas, which is hydrogen sulfur gas, within the physiological level, you can resuscitate the patient. Wow. Broadly speaking, have you discovered that this is more of a farting world than we realize? Yeah, I don't think I came into this really knowing very much about farts, but having gone into the whole research process of the book, which was aided by the fact that I knew quite a lot about animals, yeah, there was a whole wealth of animals with all sorts of strange behaviors going on around farting. For example, herring, they use farts to communicate with each other. Um, so I suppose if you were a herring, it wouldn't be, if you had the capacity to find it humorous, it wouldn't be very practical if, if that was how you were communicating. You know, humans are uncomfortable with farting, so we enjoy hearing rollicking tales of animals farting. Yeah, I would definitely say that was the case. I think like people will probably have a little bit of a yearning to live in those societies where the animals just get to fart without shame. We know for a fact that termites fart and they do produce quite a lot of methane, especially for their body size, because they live in such huge colonies. And at one point it was suggested they could be making a contribution to climate change. And, and they probably are to an extent, but actually um, that is very much outweighed by the human contribution. So we don't need to start worrying about the termites yet. That, that's, it's mostly on us, not, not on them. When we went through the process of writing the book, there was actually quite a few allusions to climate change and farting. Um, for example, um, Kangaroos were thought not to fart very much, and they thought at the time cows are farting out all this methane, and, and kangaroos don't really fart. So what if we put the gut flora from a kangaroo into a cow? Will it stop the cow producing as much methane? But actually, it turned out kangaroos do actually fart quite a lot. About the equivalent to if a horse was the same size as a kangaroo. So that plan was abandoned, and kangaroos were not the answer to climate change in the end. Uh, so that's a medium, that's a good cow, yeah, that's a, a green cow, see. This is what you consider yeah, to be the yeah, yeah. best. But this is only, of course, valid for the, for the German Holstein uh, cows. Particularly for this kind yeah. of cow, okay. Yeah. By putting animals in these air-proof chambers, scientists can figure out exactly how much gas a cow is producing. In a quantitative way, how much volume is produced by a cow, let's say per hour or per day. So for instance, we can measure that a cow can produce per day about between like 350 and 500 liters of methane. That's, uh, that sounds like a lot. Is that a lot? Yeah, that's a lot. Car carbon dioxide, methane, oxygen, and we can also measure ammonium. Here's the proof that Cows make methane. Yes. In the popular thinking, uh, the concern around climate change has re revolved around so-called farting of cows. Um, it, are, is that the problem? Are cows farting a lot of methane? No, in fact, um, they, they don't fart the methane. It's, it's about um, maximum 10%, uh, which comes out um, of the cow um, from the anus. Um, so, so the majority of, of methane is actually exhaled by the mouth and, and, and in some part also some burping, you know, but it's a minor component. So you're saying like the, the popular idea was that, that cows are farting, uh, then the second idea was no, no, they're burping, but you're even saying that it's not farting or burping, it's more just simply breathing. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an exhaling of the, of the gases, you, you exhale carbon dioxide, and with the carbon dioxide, you also exhale methane. the methane. I guess that nobody could imagine that it's, it's coming out by the mouth and not by, by the anus. So it's, it's maybe an in, in analogy to, to... To us. Yeah, sure. Of course, methane is a, a climate gas um, among the um, land-based farm animals. I mean, the ruminants are producing most of the methane. Pigs also 
produce some of it, but pigs are kind of similar to humans, you know, in my view. I mean, I don't think it's the solution to, to get rid of all, the, of all the cattle, because I think cattle have a big advantage, because they can eat things we cannot eat. And you see now, as we, if we cover the world with cows, we're producing a lot of methane. It's a question of the number of cows, of course. Um, but, but on the other hand, I mean, there, there are a lot of other climate gases produced by humans. When we drive our cars every morning to work, I mean, th this is much more than, than a cow can produce per day, you know? So um, I think we should put that in perspective. The kids with their science project were onto something. Ruminants are certainly a problem but they are part of a vaster concern. The thing about methane is that it's many times more lethal to the Earth's atmosphere than the carbon dioxide pouring out of our cars, factories, and airplanes. Add to animal farts the climate change monster lurking beneath us. A long-term study by a group of German scientists reveals the melting permafrost of Siberia has the potential for a methane fart bomb, a release so overwhelming to our human ecosystem that the result is unthinkable. Mother Earth is ready to let one go, and if she does, let's say that we're in trouble. So we are in the large peatland which is called Himmelmoor. So that's like heaven's bog. So there's carbon dioxide, which is famous greenhouse gas, and importantly also methane. So methane is about 30 times more effective per mass as a greenhouse gas. All these climate models, global models, they do not include permafrost at all. And that... How could, why did, how could they forget permafrost? Difficult to implement. And of course, these are huge amounts of methane in, in the solid state in these class rates. And if this was, would be stable, uh, destabilized, that would be a huge peak of emissions to the atmosphere. It's deep in the, below the ocean. Yeah, and um, it is probably not something which is really like the tipping point that will pop up and will change everything. So it will react slowly. It's something which reacts very slowly. <laughs> We do not know enough, I would say, especially in the Lars is cautious, but scientist Guy McPherson has come to a more chilling conclusion. I had one, one poor woman sitting next, next to me on the plane, and she asked what I do. And I said, you probably don't want to know. The last person I talked to about that tried to get out of the plane. And this time we're sitting... I met him on his lecture tour of church basements and community halls. When I add up these self-reinforcing feedback loops, sometimes called positive feedbacks, and I tack on global dimming, it, it points to me that we don't have long as a species with habitat here on Earth. And in fact, throughout many places on the planet, habitat has already disappeared. Like everybody else, I'm not a fan of my own death, much less the extinction of our own species. But I don't see any way to avoid it. I'm a huge fan of miracles at this point. Although, as we've known since the 1700s with Hume's work, miracles are pretty tough to come by. Uh, I've, I'm just connecting a few dots. And those dots, to me, don't look good. We're too far down the, route, down the line. We've triggered too many self-reinforcing feedback loops. Too, we've crossed too many tipping points. As I tell people in every one of my presentations, barring a miracle, I don't see us having a few decades. And I don't think we'll have a human being on the planet in 2027 or even in 2026. We're all contributors. Does that mean we should blame each other? Does that mean we should ask who farted? Uh, no blame, no shame, no judgment. We're all in this together. So let's act as if we're all in this together. While Guy says we're all going to die, and soon, mainstream climate scientists with data at their fingertips aren't quite so dire. 
although there are omens. Uh, there are certain scenarios uh, which uh, actually could also uh, destroy all the oxygen uh, in, in, in the atmosphere. So this basically goes through the oceans. So if the oceans uh, get too sulfurous, okay, then uh, the sulfur may get up into the atmosphere and then basically uh, would destroy all the oxygen and then you know uh, our air would look uh, more you know yellowish greenish or so but this would be an atmosphere uh, in which you couldn't live uh, i think it's not the question uh, about uh, say a runaway greenhouse effect i mean it's a question uh, about uh, justice between generations and also between poor and rich okay and, and uh, we are making lives of many people and uh, generations to come more miserable is this all a dream Are we all sleepwalking towards disaster? The warnings are all there, but we don't seem at all worried that we might lose everything. While our only world fades away. It's a windy world now, even in places it's not supposed to be. Not long after the flooding, a tornado blew through close to where we live. I mean, it was raining, it was thunder lightning, and then all of a sudden just big black clouds and stuff flying everywhere. You know, basically Armageddon. <laughs> Armageddon? Oh. Can, can... All the, the cloud uh, go the, the, from this side and go from this side. If there's one thing that parents are supposed to do, is to leave their children a future. I have a wired an instinct to be afraid of stepping in dog shit, which, which won't kill me. But I have barely any instinct at all to avoid being killed by climate change. That's right. Am I a professor of disgust? I think descriptively that's very accurate. Um, I am a professor of psychology who just has happened to study this aspect of human psychology for so long that I might as well just be called a professor of disgust at this point. The fart is a rather unique thing. You can't catch a disease from a fart as far as I know. Right? If you touch feces, especially if you eat feces, Perhaps uh, you might get sick if you touch blood, pus, right? Those are disease-bearing. Um, the fart itself carries the odor of feces. And so for that reason, it's probably disgusting, um, at least disgusting when other people fart. <laughs> um, but it does have this other property that some researchers on disgust have speculated that one of the reasons that other human beings' biological functions bother us so much is because they're reminders that we are just animals. Well, this is a, a, a well-known saying, even on the world's greatest throne, the king sits on his ass. Farts kill. Soldiers, I have been sent by King Aprius. If you remain loyal to him, oh. Take the story of a toot that brought down a king. And they have made him their king. Tell him to come back here and beg for my mercy. In ancient Egypt, a rogue general farted at the king. And he demands that you come back and beg for his mercy. Take that back to the king, Paterbimus. 
The king's reaction to the insult was to cut off the nose and ears of the messenger who brought him the news. This cruelty did not go over well with the common people. The emissary would never hear a fart again, but the king would die. Fine, fine. The people will decide. In Jerusalem in 44 AD, at a feast, an irreverent Roman soldier farted in contempt, resulting in a riot that killed 10,000 people. Farts are hell. Looking back, it's not hard to find history's one sure flatulent villain, an inhuman entity who has always wanted us to fart ourselves into the abyss. Clearly, he can only be talking about Satan. You believe, as, and you're not the only one, that, that Satan essentially farted his way out of God's grace. There's an important scene in Paradise Lost, which is right at the beginning. Um, the, the epic poem opens up just as Satan has fallen and he's awaking in the lake of fire and he's bound in adamantium chains. The way it's described, he, well, it says he rears up from the lake of hell, so already there's some butt imagery going on. Um, and the way it describes the waters parting with a mighty wind. But I think it would have been very obvious to the earliest readers that Satan was farting his way out of hell. Now, we've had, we've had both descriptions of farting his way out of hell and also farting his way into hell, isn't so there? So he farted himself out of chains uh, and onto land. And for him, he saw that as a kind of escape. Um, but what he doesn't realize until he gets a brief glimmer of this when he hops into the Garden of Eden sometimes later, uh, that hell is within him. Right? It's something, it's part of his nature. So in a sense, when he rejects God, which is about the time that the chains come off and about the time that he raises out of hell in this sulfurous cloud that's coming from his bottom, um, in a very real sense, farting himself onto land is the same as farting himself into hell. Then as now, sucks bad. It is the devil who farted. Oh, also check this out. <laughs> Nailed it. Is that almost Satan's dream? Uh, I think it's certainly a very satanic way for us to go. I mean, I think the origin of hell, um, you know, the lake of fire, uh, which is originally the lake of Gehenna, which was a festering, smoldering garbage pit that just smelled terrible. Are we as humans continuing Satan's project by virtually farting ourselves out of existence? Um, that's certainly not something that I've ever thought about before, uh, but that's an excellent way to put it. Um, I think you know, with the global warming and, and, you know, these toxic levels of methane in the atmosphere that we're creating, in a very real sense, I think we are continuing Satan's project. If there was a human supervillain in this story, it would be Britain's Mr. Methane. Among the world's most flatulent men. But like the beloved Le Peta Man, Mr. Methane's wind is mostly noise. People sometimes read something far deeper in, how can this man do this? How can it, you know, they read something far deeper into it than You the... learned how to breathe out your ass. Yes, yes, I'll breathe out of my butt, as they would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned to breathe out of my butt. I'm not the, I'm not the flexible guru I used to be. I could actually control downstairs by, I could expand the sphincter muscle. If you imagine, a best visualisation, I think, is a sperm whale's blowhole opening up to breathe. So I, 
uh, as you open it up, and it's hard to do that because as, as much as you have to tense it, you have to relax it as well. And then you raise your diaphragm and you draw air into your colon and you close the diaphragm and then you push it out and by contracting or relaxing the sphincter or bringing the buttocks into play or keeping the buttocks apart, you can alter the tone and the pitch of the, uh, the colon cough, if you like. But, but I, think, I think the public would wonder, does Mr. Uh, just, do you as a person fart socially? Yes, yeah, you do. yeah. I, but, but because I'm a, a professional, if I let one out that's, that's unscripted or inappropriate, you know, if I was on a date with a lady, uh, and look, what, it'd be a national, it'd be shame, it'd be shame upon me, you know what I mean? It'd be like missing a, a penalty shot at the World Cup football, you know, like, oh no, how can I? So, so there's some pride in the fact that I am a professional factualist, that I, you know, I, I keep it in as much as I, I can let it out. For a number of years, they'd asked me, please, would you come on the show? But we can't invite you, we, we're asking you to invite yourself. Then my agent and manager said, look, you know, we've just had a massive financial crash. Because the show is going up and up and up in the ratings. Uh, he said, it's massive exposure. Just, just do it, he said. I'm gonna put your heart into <laughs> You know, so I had to pretend that I wanted to perform in front of the Queen, which was the prize to perform at the Royal Variety. But I knew that this show, wasn't my audience, you know, my audience are more sort of alternative and, and they're not a mainstream Saturday night uh, independent television audience. And I, and I knew that the only way they could sneak me into that slot was if they presented me in a negative way and said, no, look at him, don't do that at home, children, you know, because th they weren't approving of what I, I was doing. So they were almost saying, that's terrible, you know. In just in terms of performance, it's a great, it's a show-stopping performance. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's very yeah. funny. I mean, by most people's standards, it's funny and hilarious. Yeah. But it's, there, it's what they say. It's yes. how they respond. You yeah. a disgusting creature. Shall I go? And for a while, I did feel a bit like, oh, I, knew, I knew I shouldn't, it's not my audience. I shouldn't have gone on that, that type of show. And, and a lot of people said, good on you, going on that show and farting in front of Simon Cowell, right at his face. Top man, you know, I want to shake your hand. <sighs> Sometimes, why do you bother, you know what I mean? He was such a negative. I thought, well, just have to see. There was no guarantee it would ever be broadcast. And, and I think a lot of the people who were watching the Got Talent shows are in that bracket, they're, they're not, comfortable within themselves. They're too worried about what others think, and so they accept the messages of, of Simon Cowell, who, who, to an extent, I know he's got great wealth, but he's very much in that bracket. You know, he, he's rising from here, and he's wanting to get up to, to there. You are a disgusting creature. Sure, Mr. Methane's plans to fart in the Queen's face were thwarted. Perhaps Simon Cowell is right. Humans are made of more divine stuff than mere farts. I've decided it is time to confront farts in their full horror. If farts are going to kill us, let us go to the place where farts are at their maximum.
Thank you, and uh, thank you very, uh, a very good afternoon, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the World Farting Championships. Testing, testing, <laughs> One, two, three. Um, the, the temperature is, is, is difficult to fart in this temperature, it's very hot, yeah. farting is very strenuous, so today may be not ideal for Yes, well, I did, so I'm proud of myself. Yes, a great applause. Which one? Which one you say? What do you say? Yes. No time, huh? Nothing fast. Hyvä olla, hyvä olla, kyllä sieltä jo likapaineita. It seems that you are winning again. Wow! Uh, only if no one comes and gets better. Let's see. Round and Rasta. Tom Pai. No need. Fortunately, there are some risks uh, in this kind of uh, stuff because uh, once again you risk to shed your pants. But uh, if it works, it works. So uh, once again, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. <laughs> I was really worried about this competition and I was scared. And also you can imagine that the pressure is even higher than the first time because you come here not as a beginner, you come here to prove that you are still able to do that. Finland is also really very adapted for people who like farting because in Finland you can go to the local shop and very easily you can buy this. To why are you the world farting champion? Why? You? Uh, probably, I can tell you why. Probably because I am the only one who took this shit seriously. <laughs> if they feel that um, it's um, uh, trickery, trickery. And then as farts dissipate into the hot afternoon air. Uh, you mean someone volunteering? I have a revelation. Hello. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Albert. Albert's come all the way from Canada. Bonjour. Bonjour, Monsieur Albert. Bonjour, bonjour. Hello, hello. Yes, hi, hi. Here we go. Closer, closer. Five. Suddenly. I can see it. A uh, really thick uh, fog, you know, smog. This is basically uh, how it would look like. Climate change. It has been here the whole time. 
but I had no way of seeing it. If we can't see climate change, we won't do anything about it. But now, my eyes are wide open. I need to alert the world. Answers. Who farted? I mean, really, who farted? Is it the cows, the pigs, the sheep? Is it Mother Earth? Is it Satan? Is it us driving in our cars, or is it us flying in our planes? <laughs> Is it your fault, or is it my fault? Because we didn't recycle enough? Just 100 companies, most in the business of extracting fossil fuels, have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. We've been made to feel responsible and ashamed, but it was mostly out of our hands. Or maybe not. I'm a little nervous. Okay, you made my day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all right. for all she you She asked do. you if we still had time. Do you feel we still have time? <laughs> yes, to avoid the worst, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have to wake up. We are alive at this moment. We are awake. We have to take action. We're using this guy as an open sewer. This is literally insane. Every night on the television news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation, and we've got to connect the dots between the cause and the effect. Do we as human beings have the inherent capacity to rise above our limitations and expand our moral imagination to grasp the true dangers that we face. Imagine a really thick uh, fog, you know, smog. This is basically uh, how it would look like. To the non-Americans in this room, I would say thank you for not giving up on us. We're going to get there, I'm convinced of that, and we're going to do it no matter what obstacles Washington tries to throw in our way. Because transitions take time. We've been on fossil fuels for a really long time, we've all benefited from them, and making our way out of them is hard, but a losing proposition is not supporting governments that are trying to do hard things. This is just logic, logic. We're living in a very strange world, folks, where logic doesn't have the impact it used to have, where facts, you can't even build in our political structure a, a basis of what is a fact. Powerful people have lots to say, but I'm looking for action. Finally, of all people, it is a strangely familiar wild man who brings it all home. This is what we need to do. We need to include nature 
in every corporate, state, and national climate goal. Put in place the plans, the timetables to meet those goals. Invest in mangroves and tropical forests in the same way invest in renewable energy. Work to end the destruction of these ecosystems. Commit to the effort. Because nature doesn't need people. People need nature. This is the core truth. If we are to survive on this planet, the only home any of us will ever know for our climate, for our security, for our future, we need nature. Now, more than ever. We had paradise. but we're farting it all away. So let's, let's turn off our phones, let's roll up our sleeves and let's kick this monster's ass. Could technology help heal the natural world? Tom Chi. One of the co-developers of the self-driving car says we're not being ingenious about the climate crisis. So over human history, it's estimated that we've cut down about two to two and a half trillion trees. So when I'm saying like put back a trillion, it's like I'm only putting back 40% of what we took over all these years. It's like a trillion trees. And this is where the engineering comes in. So I'm a investor and advisor in a company that is using drones to go plant trees. It can plant about 120 trees per minute at one-tenth of the cost. By my estimates, if you wanted to plant 20 billion per year for 50 years, if that was the pace you were going for, which 20 billion times 50 is a trillion, so um, then you would need about 9,000 drones operating 200 days per year. That doesn't sound too crazy, right? In terms of like the scale of hardware manufacture, these drones are not more complicated than the cell phone. Trees and actually most plants are, are more than 95% formed from air. So their trees are crystallized air, grass is crystallized air, all these plants are crystallized air. So like the mass of a tree is coming from the mass of the air that it crystallized from. So when you have a trillion trees, and let's say they weigh two tons each, and half of that um, weight is carbon, then that's a trillion tons of carbon. The actual size uh, to go plant a trillion trees uh, of the lighter variety. And of course, if you plant the heavier ones, you actually need slightly less land for this, is about half the area of Brazil. What can you and I do? I found answers in the most unlikely place. It's not exactly the Garden of Eden, but here people are trying something wild. We've changed our, our world beyond beyond going back. The only thing we can do is try and do something interesting with the tools that we've got left to us. I wrote the, the book Rewilding. It came out uh, in May this Wilding, year. Wilding, perhaps. So, Wilding. <laughs> there is. It's, it's a very difficult word, rewilding. It was going to be called rewilding, but that little prefix, the re, what it suggests is that you're trying to recapture the past, you're going backwards and trying to get back to some sort of idyllic moment before human impact. Um, we know we can't do that, um, especially not here in Sussex. I think it was very difficult in the beginning, um, particularly for neighbours looking over the garden fence. And, you know, they'd been used to this very manicured landscape and the downs in the distance. And suddenly you've got thorny scrub popping up, you've got thistles, you've got ragwort, um, things that, you know, the British absolutely abhor, wildflowers, weeds. It's really shocking, particularly if you're just letting things go. We are living in a desert, really, that it's sort of denuded, and there is a sense that a yearning for, for wildness again. And I think people are beginning to find that here. So we were really excited by the big animals, 
the wildlife is, is it, it, as much uses this garden as anywhere else. I and mean, we found a grass snake the other day in the hedge, female grass snake that must have been like that big. Slowly, we started to notice the birds, and they're obviously charismatic species. You see them coming back, you can hear them. They're a great indicator of other exciting things happening. But slowly, we've got smaller and smaller, and so we've got into our butterflies, into the dragonflies, the mayflies, and then slowly into the smaller species and the small mammals. Um, and now, really, we're returning to the soil, which is obviously where it all begins, um, into the the earthworms, we've now got 19 different species of earthworm. We've got orchids coming up in the middle of our field, so we know that the, the mycorrhizal networks are beginning to re-establish, so the soil structure is returning. And it's really come full circle. But once we had the, the species coming back, once we had our headlines of successes, like the nightingales and the turtle doves, uh, people began to think, oh, well, there is method in this madness. Um, there is something to it. So this is our oak trees of the future. There's also willows and all other species as well. Um, and it's all the same thing. And that's and um, this is also fantastic for small mammals, amphibians, reptiles. Um, the invertebrate life here is incredible. I think it's all a success. It depends who you're speaking to. If you've not lichenologists come here, then they talk about the lichen species or the fungi. We've got a lot of rare fungi here, rare beetles. So everything is a success. You know, a lot of typical nature reserves are sort of bent on keeping everything in one place and not letting anything out. But effectively here, we're, we're allowing everything to, to make up its own mind um, and be here or be not, you know? This is one of our highest fields of vegetation. So we've got a couple of fields like this where they're just really high. Yeah. To me, anyway, this is probably my opinion of it, it, it's simply stepping back and allowing nature to function and creating resilience as well, especially in times we are now with pests and diseases to worry about, invasive. Um, you know, non-native species, um, people, you know, impacting the environment, climate change. There's so much going on. And I think if you can have an ecosystem that's allowed to function, allowed to develop naturally, then it's got more chance of surviving. We were astonished by the speed with, with which it came. It's been a transformation for the estate. And people are coming in their droves. I mean, we've been completely inundated. And this year we're sort of dazzled, really, by by the by the amount of people who've found us, um, because we really are the only place in lowland Britain that is doing this. And we're just beginning to understand how, how wild spaces affects us, um, psychologically and mentally and physically. We have to address these, these problems, and it's amazing how many boxes rewilding ticks. Um, and obviously carbon sequestration is a huge, is a huge tick nature bounces back given half a, a chance. We're looking at uh, a, 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 a cow farm, in effect, um, and the difference here is that rather than it being controlled and, and, uh, and structured in a traditional way, it's, it's, it, you're, you've allowed it to rewild. Yes, absolutely. We're on a tiny scale, and so if you can demonstrate the sorts of uh, results that we're having on this sort of scale, wow, you know, what about giving a little bit more space? Here, people are just letting things go. Trees are growing. Animals, birds, and flowers are making a comeback. Here, the cows produce less methane because they run wild. And this concept is catching on around the world. Vast rewilding projects are being proposed on nearly every continent. Are we all going to die because of farts? We don't know yet. might have been sleepwalking. But not anymore.